the colleges and universities of the nation, CBS Television brings you The Search. The search to know and understand man and his work. The search for a richer, happier life for all. Mrs. Hill, won't you come in and sit down over there? And we'll let Small Fry cruise a bit. There you are. Let's go play. Come on in, Mrs. Hill, and you just go over and sit down on the couch. I'm Charles Romine. We're here to follow an adventure in detection. An adventure whose outcome can affect the happiness of you and your children. At the same time, we're going to be seeing some great new advances in the struggle against an invisible and greatly misunderstood handicap, deafness. With us is Dr. John E. Bordley, professor of otolaryngology at the Johns Hopkins University and Hospital. Dr. Bordley, could you tell us uh, what's going on here in this room? We've made arrangements for you to look in on the diagnostic study of a two-year-old child. What's wrong with him? His mother suspects he's deaf. That's for us to find out. His uh, medical history has already been taken, and his ears, nose, and throat have been examined by one of our ear specialists. Now he's being brought in for a diagnostic study on his hearing. Uh, that's uh, Dr. William Hardy, director of the Hearing and Speech Center, and that's uh, Dr. Miriam Pauls. Good morning, Mrs. Hill. I'm Dr. Hardy. You've already met Dr. Pauls. Mm -hmm. Suppose we review the general picture with Barry just a bit and see that we all agree about some of the details. So far as you know, was there any hearing impairment in the family? No, there hasn't been. And you have other children? Yes, I have two others. Older, younger? One older and a younger baby. And they've been perfectly normal yes. as far as hearing mm -hmm. is concerned. When did he first sit up? At about five or six months. And that's perfectly well within normal range. Mm -hmm. How about walking? I don't mean pulling himself up, but walking independently. That was slower. Um, he was 22 months. So that was just really recently, a couple very months recently. ago. Mm -hmm. I noticed that Dr. Pauls and Dr. Hardy are watching Barry very carefully. Why? First, deafness changes the entire development of a child. We must learn as much as we can about his total behavior. Beside, we don't know yet whether he is deaf. When did you begin to suspect hearing impairment? Well, I asked him to get away from the coffee table. And I got no response. So I called my husband and I said, Ernie, that child just doesn't mind anymore. And my husband blew a whistle. No response. So... Uh, Barry wasn't looking at him at the No, he, his back. Uh, he was turned away from us. And then um, he clapped his hands. No response. We tried just every sound conceivable. I went out into the kitchen and picked up this pan and hit the lid against it just as hard as I could. We got absolutely no response from the youngster. Then, of course, the realization that he couldn't hear, and I rushed to the phone to call the doctor and got an appointment for the next day. We started making inquiries. Uh, several men at home were uncertain whether Barry heard or not. It was felt that there was some hearing, but no one knew how much. Then someone recommended that we come to John Hopkins, and that is the reason that I brought Barry here. We wanted a direct answer. We'd like to know if there is any hearing and how much. Barry, hold him right where he 
he is, Mrs. Hill. Barry. <whistles> Barry. <whistles> Barry. Now we'll have to try the old rooster and see what he does to that. Certainly no question about it, Mrs. Hill. He has some hearing. Now the point is to find out exactly how much. too happy about the whole thing. No, he's not very happy. It's the adhesive tape that's bothering him. He's not being hurt. Dr. Bordley, I wonder if you could explain something to us about this test. I understand it was developed here at Johns Hopkins by you and Dr. Hardy. That's right. It helps solve some of the problems that have been baffling uh, my particular profession for many years. Now, what are those problems? Well, it's to determine exactly how hard of hearing a child is. You see, uh, I think everyone agrees that many of these children could be helped a great deal more if their hearing loss was discovered early. Ideally, they should be started in training between 18 months and two years. Uh, that's the uh, peak period of their learning ability for speech, and it's before uh, deafness has kind of warped them. You mean even if a child can't be cured, you can compensate for his deafness by training? The majority of children diagnosed as deaf still have some hearing, uh, which, if found early enough, can be used profitably in training. The important thing, though, is an accurate diagnosis, because a difference in the type of hearing loss may mean a difference in the type of training. We're just about ready to start now. The machine Dr. Hardy is adjusting is called an audiometer. It produces a pure tone of any desired intensity, that is, uh, loudness or softness, and any desired frequency or pitch. We can also select which ear the sound goes to so that we can test each ear independently. We usually start with a frequency of 500 cycles and make the tone good and loud. Then we follow it with an electric shock, which is administered through a pair of electrodes on the calf of Barry's leg. It's a very mild shock, just enough to startle the child a bit, but not to hurt him in any way. We made sure of that in consultation with pediatricians and psychiatrists. Here we go again. The change in his skin resistance is recorded by an ink writer. Watch the pen. See that sudden upward swing? That was in response to the shock. Notice that there's no reaction right after the tone is sounded, only after the shock. After a few repetitions, Barry will become conditioned because the shock is always preceded immediately by a sound. He will unconsciously react to that sound in anticipation of the shock. There, see the pen swing? Then comes the response to the shock. Now that Barry is conditioned, we can get down to the business of testing his hearing. We just lower the intensity of the sound a little. And still we get a response to the tone. We lower it again. 
and he still hears the sound. Still lower. Still a response to the sound. Once more. This time, no response to the tone. That's a tired little tacker you have there, but a little sleep and he'll be back on his feet again. Now, Ms. Hill, we've been over all of our tests uh, with Barry and he has a loss of about 50 to 55 decibels in uh, speech range. Now that's a moderately severe loss, not too severe. You've probably heard about hearing being cured if it's discovered early enough. Barry's is not that type. His is a nerve type loss where there's injury to the auditory nerve and there's no cure for it from a medical or surgical point of view. He has sufficient residual hearing, however, so that an aid will give him substantial help. He won't have to go to a school for the deaf or any such institution. If you're willing to take the time and the trouble to spend with him at home, working with him, he will be able to uh, become a normal child. He'll be able to learn sound, learn to use sound, and he'll be able to talk, and you'll be able to communicate with other children. This is going to take a lot of learning on your part. You've got to learn all about his problems. And to do that, I'm going to suggest that you have a long talk with Dr. Hardy. Well, now, I'm going to try to let you hear just about the way Barry does with his hearing loss. Can you hear me now all right? Well, what you're getting is just about the level of average conversational voice. Now, with Barry's loss, which affects both uh, loudness and the clarity of sound, this is the way this average conversational voice would seem. Did you hear me? Well, now let's try something a little louder. Suppose one day, Mrs. Hill, you get good and mad at Barry, and you want to say, Barry, you get away from that cookie jar, do you hear? Now, with his hearing loss, dropping down in loudness, but especially affecting clarity, so that the high tones don't come through. This is about the way that remark would sound. Now, Barry, get away from that cookie jar. What about a hearing aid, Dr. Hardy? Well, it'll help a great deal, Mrs. Hill. Of course, I can't duplicate exactly the effect of a hearing aid, uh, as, as Barry would hear with it. But let's take that scolding you gave Barry a moment ago. Uh, remember, Barry, get away from that cookie jar, do you hear? And see what it's like. Barry, get away from that cookie jar. The effect would be very much like that, Mrs. Hill. Now, that may not sound like very much to you, but you'd be amazed at what that can mean to a little boy with this kind of hearing loss, provided, of course, that he's given the necessary training. In a nutshell, the problem is this. A hearing aid alone won't make sound come alive for Barry. His hearing loss is too great for that. He needs not only to become aware of sound, but to learn the habit of listening. Your first big training job at home is to teach Barry how to listen, to learn the meaning of sound by filling his environment with sounds of all kinds all day long and most important, by talking to him constantly, every minute of time that you can. What about Barry's learning how to talk? Well, there's nothing wrong with Barry's vocal cords, Mrs. Hill. But remember that children talk because they hear and as they hear. And once Barry begins to learn that the sounds of speech mean something, he'll be ready to talk. Now, don't misunderstand. For him to learn to talk well and fairly normally, is going to take long, long years of very hard effort on your part and his and everybody else's. It'll be worth it. Mrs. Hill, I've just made arrangements for you to look in on a couple of the training sessions with some of the youngsters here at the center. It'll give you a better idea of what lies ahead for you and Barry. 
You can leave Barry downstairs in the nursery while you look around. Turn it around. Turn it around. It goes right here. This little fellow is already responding to sound. What we want to do now is help him learn how to distinguish here. one sound from another. Wheel. Wheel. It goes over here. Right here, Tad. There's the other wheel. Wheel. Now let's see if we can get Tad interested in some toys that make different kinds of sounds. And here's the cow. The cow. Make a cow go moo. May I help you? Fine, you sit back there next to Paige. All right. What is that big blue thing there in the living room? Sofa. 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 Begins with an S. Sofa. Sofa. Uh -huh. sofa. These little girls both have severe hearing losses. Because what they hear is distorted, their speech is also distorted. It's going to take years of hard work for them to develop smooth, fluent speech. But at least they're talking and can make themselves understood. Cherry. T. Cherry jam. T. Jam. Chip. T. Chip. Chip. Chocolate. Chip. Chocolate. Chocolate. Chocolate chip ice cream. Chocolate chip ice cream. That's good. Carol, can you say it? Chocolate chip ice cream? Chocolate chip ice cream. That's pretty good. Try it again. Let's hear ice cream. Chocolate ice cream. cream. Put your hands down a minute. Chipmunk. Chipmunk. Chocolate. Chocolate. Chocolate chip ice cream. Chocolate chip ice cream. Ice cream. Ice cream. Lobe. Lobe. Loaf. Loaf. Lower. Lower. Now let's try some it words. Bite. Bite. Fight. Fight. Night. Night. White. White. That's very good. Now, if you'll do me a favor, please, just stay right where you are. We have somebody outside who I'm sure would like to meet you. Mrs. Hill, this is Miss Gulick. How do you do? Hello. Mrs. Hill's little boy has been going through the diagnostic process here today, Helen. He has a hearing loss of about 55 decibels. I thought Mrs. Hill would be very much interested in sitting in while we talk for a couple of minutes. How is this? Can you hear me all right? Very well. How much hearing loss have you, Helen? I was born with a hearing defect. And how much is it? About 70 decibels. You understand, Mrs. Hill, that that is approximately five times more hearing loss than Barry has. Do you, can you remember back, Helen, uh, how did you get started in, in learning to, to understand language? I started to learn when I was about two on my mother's knee. In other words, that did much the same thing as amplification do does. 
Yes. And then what about school? Did you have a special schooling? Yes, I went to public schools like all other children and had a few lessons outside, either at home or after school. That continued till I was in ninth grade. After that, I was on my own. All the way through to college, I had nothing but public school instruction. And then what did you do after you finished college? What do you, what do, you do now? Well, I am doing personnel work with the Navy and uh, they are of varied natures in Naval Research Laboratory. You saw that really most of your daily time is spent in, in direct contact with people. Yes, I do, both at work and outside. Well, what about your social life, Ellen? What, what happens outside? Well, I attend modern dance classes. I teach Sunday school on Sunday mornings. And, well, I have one special interest a young man that I go around with. Well, that's a good idea. What, uh, what does he do, Helen? Is he... He's an economist with the government. And of course, he has normal hearing? Yes, he does. He has normal hearing. You haven't set a date yet, I suppose. No. Well, that's very good, Helen. Thank you very much. We'll see you again in about a month, and we'll arrange to take you through some trials with these new transistor hearing aids. That's right. Awfully well, glad to have met you, Mrs. Hill. I hope to see you again. Well, how do you feel about things now, Mrs. Hill? So relieved to know where Barry stands at last, Dr. Hardy. In the long run, you'll be glad you've acted as promptly as you have. That's one of the things we're trying to get across to parents. That when a youngster doesn't respond to sound, or when his overall development is a bit slow, it's terribly important to get his hearing tested early. If his hearing is affected, sooner or later, something's got to be done about it. The longer that decision is put off, the more and more difficult it becomes to assure a child of a reasonably normal life, the way Barry's going to be. Well, let's talk about the hearing aid. It'll take a few days for the ear mold impression to be ready. Could you make arrangements to stay in town? Not very well with two youngsters in Cleveland. I'd better come back. When will it be ready? All right, the mold will be ready in about four days. We'll let you know. That'll be fine. This is the hearing aid. This is the receiver which goes into his ear. And this is the microphone which makes sound louder. See, we'll put it in his ear just like this. <coughs> oh, Barry, that's all right. That's all right. Barry. Barry. First time he's heard sound in such a big dose, and naturally he's a bit overwhelmed, but he'll adjust to it pretty quickly. Have it. Uh -huh. 